Today's uh, scripture for Palm Sunday comes from Luke chapter 20, starting with verse 28 through 40. And Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. He just uh, spoke with Zacchaeus in a couple of verses beforehand. So if that kind of sets the stage for you a little bit, that helps me anyway. So after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethav and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. May God add his, add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Well, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. One of the most famous pictures on American TV screens is that of the President of the United States walking across the South Lawn of the White House to board Marine One, his white-topped VH-3D helicopter for the quick trip to Andrews Air Force Base to rendezvous with Air Force One, the flying White House. It all looks so impressive from the Marine Guard salute to the famous light blue plane taxiing down the runway. It's what we don't see that's even more impressive, however. Getting the president from place to place is a bit like planning the Normandy invasion. It involves hundreds of hours and millions of dollars and tons of hardware, making your last plane trip look like a cakewalk by comparison. Let's say the president is coming to our town to speak. Even before the president takes off, Secret Service agents and local law enforcement at each destination have already been hard at work for days or sometimes weeks or months interviewing and screening people who would be close to the president. They analyze primary and alternate routes through the city and sweep the site of the meeting or rally for any security problems. And if the destination is a foreign country, coordination with the host nation requires even more planning and rehearsal to ensure the president's safety. On board Air Force One, the president and his entourage travel with all the possible security precautions in place. This VC-25A plane, which shares its airframe with the 747, takes off with a quarter million pounds of thrust generated by eight engines, which enable the plane to get airborne quickly when security concerns require it. The plane has a maximum speed of 630 miles an hour and can travel 6,800 miles without being refueled. Air Force One also contains multiple electronic and material countermeasures to ward off an aerial attack. In the cabin, everything is appointed with comfort and workability in mind. The president's cabin is su suite is located near the nose of the plane and has couches that fold out into beds complete with blankets monogrammed with a presidential seal. And the presidential needs not turn, president need not turn off his cell phone before takeoff because he doesn't have one in the first place. There's over 80 phones on the plane 
and there's 238 miles of communication cable along with internet and satellite links. There are workspace and conference rooms with leather chairs, and in case of an emergency, a medical room is on board stocked with a pharmacy, an x-ray machine, an operating table, and it's staffed by a full-time surgeon. No Chimpsy air food, airline food either. Air Force One has two galleys staffed by five chefs who can serve up to 100 meals at a time. And you thought your upgrade to first class was nice. There are actually two identical Air Force or BC-25 planes that serve as Air Force One. An aircraft is called Air Force One only if the president is actually on board. And both planes are flown to destinations, so there's always a backup plane. And accompanying all this, there are two massive Air Force C-5 cargo planes that contain the armored presidential limousines, which includes a decoy, and accompanying support vehicles for a motorcade that's including a fully stocked ambulance. The cargo planes land well in advance of Air Force One to begin assembling and staging all necessary vehicles to be ready the second the president steps off the plane. So when Air Force One rolls to a stop at the tarmac at the local airport or air base, there's no mistaking the famous blue paint scheme and the presidential seal of the, and the distinctive United States of America lettering on the fuselage. For five decades, the image of an American president emerging from that famous plane has been a fixture in world events. Now, here's the deal, my friends. If it takes all of this for the president of the United States just to make a speech, what, what did it look like for the king of kings, for God's chosen ruler of the whole world to make his grand entrance at the beginning of the most important week the world has ever known. Well, Luke and the other gospel writers give us a window into the travel arrangements that were needed when Jesus came into Jerusalem and into the environment was, that was anything but secure. First, there was the reason for the trip. Presidents usually go where they're invited to make a speech or to attend a meeting. And Jesus received no invitation to come to Jerusalem. No summit meeting was scheduled with the temple officials who had no doubt heard about Jesus' teaching and his healing. There was no town hall meeting that was set with the Pharisees and the Sadducees on the pressing issues of the Torah and purity practice that Jesus had controversially, controversially circumvented or modified. No one had put together a press conference about his most recent activity in Jericho, where he healed a blind beggar and ate with a known tax collector. Like Air Force One flying the president unannounced to be with troops in some far-off remote place, Jesus shows up unexpectedly. But Jesus knew all along that he would need to make this trip. In Luke chapter 18, verse 31, Jesus tells his disciples, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that's written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. And he goes on to predict his death and the resurrection for the third time. But even his own cabinet of disciples do not understand the plan. And then there's this mode of transportation. In the first century Roman world, Emperors always made their arrival in a city with a great deal of pomp and circumstances. Elite troops carried Roman standards, the equivalent of big, bold letters on a plane. The emperor himself entered the city riding on a war horse, the ancient forerunner of a jet, or in a chariot, which acted like an ancient armored limo. Jesus, however, eschews those decorations and instead has a donkey commissioned as his royal mode of transport. And it isn't even a full-grown donkey. It's a colt. Four spindly legs versus the powerful hoofs of a horse or a quarter million pounds of thrust in Air Force One. Jesus does have the disciples act a little like a, a first-century messianic secret service, when they go to pick up the stocky, 
giving a kind of secret, secret code word. They say the word, the Lord, needs it. A young donkey with a large passenger struggling down the steep road that leads from the Mount of Olives to the eastern gate of Jerusalem may seem a little ridiculous to us compared to the white-topped helicopters and the jumbo jets. But to the people gathering around to watch Jesus' arrival, the mode of transport was perhaps even more symbolic than Air Force One is to us. By riding into Jerusalem on a hum humble donkey, Jesus was making a very specific political statement and messianic claim, echoing the prophet's imagery in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Instead of a display of power and might with armed security and fighter escorts, this king comes in humble and riding on a donkey. What about the crowd? The crowd accompanying Jesus was as humble as his conveyance. A ragtag collection of disciples and hangers-on spreading their cloaks in the road, which was the ancient equivalent of rolling out the red carpet. This was not an ordinary king promoting his own glory and flaunting his symbols of power, but rather it's a fisher king, a king for fishermen, for tax collectors, and for prostitutes and demoniacs and cripples. Many of these people probably wouldn't have passed a secret service screening, but they nonetheless lined the road for the approaching donkey cave, shouting a messianic campaign slogan, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. The religious elite certainly understood what Jesus was doing by arriving in the city this way, unannounced and unauthorized. Rather than joining the cheering supporters, they staged a protest. And eventually they'll realize that this would-be king's security detail was pretty weak. And they would make sure that Jesus left the city on their terms, wanting him to stagger, not swagger, not indeed carrying a symbol of defeat and death, the cross. Of course, we know that a week later, Jesus will make another unannounced arrival for which no one was prepared making an empty tomb the focal point of all of human history. Presidents and their planes will come and go, but because of Easter, there's only one eternal king for whom the world waits in anticipation. Palm Sunday is a great time for us to assess our preparation for the king's arrival, not only in our individual lives and hearts, but also in eschatological terms. Speculating on the mode of transport for Jesus' return, be it surfing on a cloud or riding a celestial steed, a la the apocalyptic imagery of Revelation, is an exercise that some Christians have made into a booming theological business. We have to remember, though, the king arrived here first humbly, being born in a manger, and then began his inauguration week by riding into the city on a laughable little donkey. If our king comes to us so gently and humbly, how might we prepare for his return by following his example? Would we be prepared when he comes back? Are we serving others humbly? Are we not counting our own gain, but helping those that are in greatest need? In this beautiful illustration from Tom Long's well-known preaching guide, The Witness of Preaching, a pastor shared a true story of what humbly valuing, valuing human life can look like when God's kingdom takes root in our lives. In the newspaper, there was a story about the process families go through in adopting children. And the account related the usual details, the huge number of couples wanting to adopt and the much smaller number of desirable children that, and the extremely long waiting lists and the high legal fees, the red tape, and the resulting increase of interest in surrogate, surrogate parents and so on. 
The story also, though, told of the experience of the Williams family. The Williamses, a deeply religious couple, have adopted four children so far, and they hope to adopt at least one more child in the future. And for the Williamses, there's been no delays, no waiting lists. And the reason is that all of the children that the Williamses have adopted are disabled. One, a son, has Down syndrome, and the other three, two daughters and another son, have major birth defects. All of the Williams children are in the euphemism of the adoption agencies. They're difficult to place. And in a world where a virtually every prospective parent dreams of a bright and beautiful and perfect child, the Williamses have chosen to offer the embrace of their parental love to children almost no one else wanted. Our children are our greatest joy, Mrs. Williams was quoted as saying. Caring for them is what we've been put on this earth to do. If Jesus were to arrive in our congregation this Sunday, how would we welcome him? With what stories would we regale him? With what songs and shouts would we praise him? What would we pr be proud to show him or ashamed to show him? Would we recognize him for who he is or like the religious leaders, would we mistake him for someone else because his humility doesn't fit our perception of what a leader should be? How would we roll out the red carpet for this king? Jesus, the king of kings, the savior of the world, came riding into Jerusalem not on a magnificent steed, not riding in a chariot, but rather on a humble donkey. And as we enter Holy Week, we're ready to accept him. Are we ready to accept him as our Lord and our King? How do you respond to the humble one that is our Savior?